Hey everybody, it's Gauntletx, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing our very first remix draft of the Artifacts format. This is a brand new kind of draft format that's kind of like a mix between a cube draft and a regular draft. They're taking cards from all over Arena, all different sets, and putting them into one draft format, but much like a regular draft, those packs are still going to have the same number of commons, uncommons, and rares in them as any regular format, and you are going to keep all the cards you draft, unlike the cube draft format. So pretty interesting thing here. It's basically like a master's set on Arena. So you can just imagine this is the Artifacts master's set. So pretty pumped about it. It's a new thing they're trying out. It seems cool. It seems like it should be fun to draft. But we'll find out soon enough as we head into the draft and see where the cards take us today. All right, and here we are now for the pack one pick one. This is a really sweet pack. We've got a Cloudsteel Kieran. 3 mana, 3, 2, flyer, and if you can reconfigure onto something else, you can't lose the game until your opponent kills whatever you equip this to, and then you auto-die if you have zero or less life at the time. So it's pretty cool, it's very fun, and pretty powerful, but these uncommons are wild. Hex Gold Halberd being a 2 mana, 2, 2, first strike trample during your turn that that can re-equip later in the game is super strong, but Evolving Adaptive, a 1 mana, 1, 1 that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you play more creatures, really my cup of tea here. I think these are all super powerful options. The commons are great as well. In a, a set that has so many artifacts, Oaken Siren's probably super awesome, and Welding Sparks as well, dealing damage equal to the number of artifacts you control, plus three. Just really looks like a very powerful set. That's what I'm catching on to out of that first pack. For pick two, Captured by Legax. That's pretty interesting if we pushed to green-white specifically. It's a pacifism, stopping the creature from attacking and blocking, and it puts some counters on your board. So that's pretty cool. Um, we do have a scrapwork cohort here, which is a huge, huge, really high pickup for me. Honestly, even more than like Combat Thresher out of white, um, because cohort we can play no matter what colors our deck ends up being, as long as we just have a tiny bit of random fixing, like a Chromatic Star or something, uh, then we can unearth it pretty easily. And it's really solid value up front. Two creatures off of the one spell. I'm pretty into Scrapwork Cohort. I think I'd even take it over Vengeful Rebel thanks to that colorless kind of flexibility. But Rebel's great too. Potential removal spell on a stick. Another really strong looking pack. But I kind of like uh, moving towards green-white for now. Adaptive and Scrapwork Cohort to start things off. But Scrapwork Cohort really doesn't tie us uh, to white or anything. Mandible Justice here is probably real strong in this set. It is definitely very strong to curve this into Scrapwork Cohort, have two creatures enter the battlefield on turn four, have this attack as a 4-3 lifelinker, so that's really exciting. But Contagious Vorak is always an excellent value play. Three mana, three, three that picks up another land when you play it. We are slightly more tied to green than white. And if it's late in the game and we don't need the extra land, we can proliferate when this hits the board, which is really good. Alternatively, Cleanup Crew even, 6 mana 6-6 six, six, that almost always blows something up. Probably insane, right? Hold up. Yeah, you do have to recontextualize a lot of these cards when you consider that like half the set is artifacts. So this will almost always have a target to blow up when it enters the battlefield. So not only are you dropping down a creature that's big enough to try to just end the game, but it's also blowing up one of your opponent's best cards, ideally. If it's not, it has backup plans. You can just gain some life, which is still good. Yeah, Cleanup Crew actually seems really sweet. And Gaia's Gift is great with really big creatures like Cleanup Crew or an evolving adaptive that's managed to grow throughout the game. So I like the Gaia's Gift here and just cut green. Although Ornithopter Paradise is interesting. It's mana fixing for any deck. It's a 2 mana 0-2 flyer that ramps up as well. So it's pretty cheap for the, uh, the mana ramp to get to your expensive plays early. Um, Oak and Siren's cool, but I think Ornithopter Paradise for the flexibility looks kind of sweet there. Pick 5. Ooh, Hamlet Glutton. There's probably tons of bargain fodder in this set as well, because if you have any clue tokens on the board, any food tokens on the board, any treasure tokens, then you can cast this as a 5-mana 6-6 six, six trample and gain some life. So, kind of a weird place to start our very first draft of the artifact set. Start with green and just be focused on big, beefy, non-artifact spells. But uh, if you've watched any of my videos in the past, you know how much I love artifact shenanigans and build-arounds and stuff like that. So we will have plenty of time 
to play tons of super artifact focused decks. So let's just start with some green beef and Ridge Scale Tusker is one of the beefiest. A five mana five five already a good power toughness for the mana cost and it buffs your entire board when it hits the field. It was one of the best uncommons in Kaladesh Remastered, which was one of my favorite draft formats on Arena and I'm really happy to take it here. It's going to be awesome, especially if we get to go cohort into the Tusker. That'll be sick. And pick seven, green's looking open. We get another Hamlet Glutton. All right, we need to find a lot more cheap plays, but we have plenty of big green beef to top off our curve and to make sure that our adaptive keeps evolving. So really happy to take any more Ornithopter of Paradise type cards to just get to the beef early. And Old Tech Cloud Guard looks pretty awesome here. It's very similar to the Scrapwork Cohort, but this one is less flexible. You do have to have the white mana to play it, but it is a two creatures off of one spell kind of card, which works pretty excellently with Ridge Scale Tusker. We could also sacrifice the Gnome uh, as our bargain fodder for the Hamlet Glutton, so it also curves into that as well. Just looks pretty great. So Obsessive Skinner would give us a two mana spell, which is interesting. I don't think we're going to be the greatest at hitting Delirium and getting multiple plus one plus one counters off of this, but just having another two mana creature looks decent. I think I'd rather just have Byway Courier though, like that it trades off and then gives us a clue to, to get some more value throughout the game. So we'll take that, but there are some like proliferate kind of cards that I've seen running around, some cards that can add to the counters you have on board, so that could be interesting. Take a Renegade map here. Potential fixing, um, Slagwoods Bridge, potential fixing. Uh, if we get pushed off the white, or if we splash a bit, that's pretty late voltage surge, and didn't want to mention it because I've been talking so much about all the other stuff, but we've been seeing a lot of pretty solid red cards going late, and double voltage surge? Pick 12, pick 13, literally the last two picks of the draft, that means we should definitely be open to going green-red instead of green-white here, and we've even got a dual land to help go in that direction. For pack 2, pick 1, I imagine we gotta just take Untethered Express, insane card that goes in any deck it is a four mana four four trampler um you have to crew it for one but every time it attacks it gets a plus one plus one counter on it so the first time it attacks it's actually a five five trampler then a six six trampler it's so easy to crew this you just crew it with your one one tokens like your soldiers and your gnomes and stuff really excellent card and i'm going to take that here the other options are welding sparks since we're potentially pushing to red with the double voltage surge or the Scrapwork Cohort that works great with the Ridge Scale Tuskers and the Hamlet Gluttons and stuff, giving us that Soldier Token to put counters onto or to sacrifice. Uh, but I'm just going to take on Tethered Express. I think that is a super, super high pick. Pack 2, pick 2. All right, green, red it is, because Dragonwing Glider is going to be the strongest card in our deck so far. 5 mana for a 4-4 four, four Flying Haste, and if that creature, the Rebel Token, ever dies, we can move the equipment around Maybe get super lucky and give a Hamlet Glutton flying in haste and just go wild. So Dragonwing Glider is insane. This pack in general is insane, and I think I'm going to be saying that a lot. But there are two really, really excellent removal spells here between Rebel Salvo, super cheap, instant speed, and Static Net that can deal with basically anything, gain you some life, and ramp you if you have enough artifacts with that Power Stone. So both of these removal spells also super high picks but they're not quite the Dragon Wing Glider level bomb rare. So pack two, pick three. Now we just get another uh, Hamlet Glutton. We could take Sunder Shaman, I guess. Four mana, five, five. We have to be pure red green to ever have a hope of casting this. So no splashing for this card. When it deals combat damage to player, destroy an... Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's very chumpable. Right, they just trump it with a 1-1 token every turn if they have token production. But if they can't block it, that is a massive swing. Five damage plus blow up their best artifacts. I'll take that Sunder Shaman. It's also a really beefy creature for the evolving adaptive again. Alright, pack two, pick four. Probably have enough artifacts that Goblin Tomb Raider is gonna be a 2-2 haste most of the time for only one mana, but Welding Sparks is also a huge pick. Does this get bigger when a creature with greater toughness is played? Yes. So playing a Goblin Tomb Raider will make Evolving Adaptive bigger. Kind of puts it up a little bit in my pick order. We have seen Welding Sparks and Voltage Surges. Voltage Surges specifically going insanely late, so hopefully we just get the removal pick 12 and pick 13 again and just take the great creature here. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, there it is. Welding Sparks. Uh, I do like the mana ramp of our Gothian Opportunist. However, it doesn't actually ramp into all our big creatures. Um, it does ramp into our Dragon Wing Glider. I guess it sort of ramps into Hamlet Glutton, right? Because we can sacrifice the Power Stone for the bargain. Yeah, I think Opportunist looks excellent. Again, based on how Pack 1 went, I think we're in reverse world here where we take the removal later after the decent plays. When you first learn to draft, you always hear you want to take bombs, then removal, and then everything else. But here, with double voltage surge already that we got with literally nothing else in the pack, I think we just see if it comes back around again. Okay, now we can go ahead and just take a uh, a two mana blocker here. The obsessive skinner or the mere sire dies and replaces itself, so it's great to bargain away to like Hamlet Glutton here. So that's interesting. Um, depending how many, how much we really want artifacts over non artifacts. I don't know. I think I still take Skinner though. Okay, pick seven. Do I take this removal over Skinner? We've got a decent amount of modified creatures. Our Evolving Adaptive has a counter on it, so that's modified. Our Obsessive Skinner will put a counter on something, so that's modified. Our Dragon Wing Glider is an equipment, so that's modified. Our Untethered Express has a counter, so that is modified. Yeah, we'll take Flame Discharge. We'll actually go ahead and take removal at some point. Well, there's another one. Uh, I think I would have rather had a second Skinner then a second flame discharge, but I can't go back on that now. I could take Gaia's Gift, another way to modify stuff. Song Shaper will be really fun in like red, blue or something with like a ton of artifacts. I think I'm going to take Gaia's Gift over a second flame discharge. I actually really don't love multiples of the big X mana burn spell because it's going to cost us a lot, but I will start taking all the welding sparks, which looks like they are at least one of them is going to come back around. All right, here's another modified creature, Servant of the Scale. One mana for a 1-1 one, one when it dies, you put its counter somewhere else. That's fine. Probably get cut before anything else, but we'll see. Well, we've got a whole deck. We've got 23 cards here, so the final pack is entirely about making the deck better. And many cards in this pack would make the deck better. I think Captain Lannery Storm is going to be the most insane. A uh, three mana two two haste that gives you a treasure token every turn. Alternatively, if you just keep sacrificing the treasure, she's like a three mana three two haste, which is also just great. Um, but she's an excellent way to ramp into plenty of our big explosive top end cards. So I think she's kind of perfect for the deck. But there's so many random artifact tokens running around that tough cookie is going to be awesome in this format as well. Um, Scrapwork mutt's a great value play. It's also a good early play and we're looking for more two three mana cards so that would be helpful for the deck another hamlet glutton wouldn't hurt um, but we definitely want the ramp before that it's just a really good pack for us but i think it's got to be lannery there all right what do we have at a pack three pick two a little bit of removal here with epic confrontation i think that is literally it out of green or red there's no very good artifacts here sadly no colorless options really so epic confrontation it is. I'll take that over salivating gremlins. I've already got one, and I don't think I really want it in this deck. We are not a very artifact heavy deck. We're in green red. That's probably one of the least artifact heavy color pairs. Green in general, for sure. Pack three, pick three. Oh, I want to draft Captain Storm in this format. Captain Storm's got to be the absolute nuts in this. Oh, uh, that's so sick. Is a he as well is just always a four mana five six flyer, which is a ridiculously cheap rate. Um, for us though, I do like the fierce witch stalker, but we're doing great on four, five, six mana plays. I'm gonna take the scrapwork mutt, get another turn two play, and this is one that can help make sure that our deck plays a little more consistently. Uh, if we're flooding out a little bit, then we ditch an extra land. If we need more lands and we've just got a bunch of spells, we ditch. Uh, one of those to try to dig closer. It just really helps your deck play out more consistently, so I'm very happy with it. Pick four. Yeah, they put they put the whole blue-red artifact deck from Lost Caverns of X Ixalan in this format, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, for us, it's just Obsessive Skinner. They also put a lot of green-black food stuff, like Candy Grapple, Hamlet Glutton stuff. This is a sweet format. Seems like just a lot of the strongest archetypes, the strongest artifact-focused archetypes from... Uh, from Arena's history, which is pretty cool. Pick five, I guess we are taking a Hamlet Glutton here. Yeah, I don't love it because I've got a lot of top end, but I don't hate it and there's really no other option for this deck. 
Pick six, all right. Another flame discharge it is. Pick seven, another Slagwoods Bridge. I don't really want too many tap lands, but we've got a really difficult mana cost here with the double red, double green Sunder Shaman. The alternative is to take another three drop to trade off with like a Byway Courier or an Arcbound Tracker. I guess I really don't like salivating gremlins in this deck, so I, I do want to keep up to like four three mana blockers here. Just get rid of the gremlins. I think that's fine. Although now there's a plundering pirate, which I think is just better. Just ramp into the big stuff. So I guess five three mana cards it'll be. Pick nine, another Hamlet Gladden. I'm definitely not playing Fiery Intervention. That is too much mana for the removal, even if it can destroy any artifact. That's just probably way too inefficient. I don't think I'm playing a fourth Hamlet Glutton either, though, but I think it's more likely. All right, well, it's starting to get to the deck building here. Our deck's going to look... Like, probably the least artifact-heavy deck that I will ever draft in this format. I can't imagine that I, I don't get pulled into the allure of cards like Captain Storm if I see them in pack one, pick one in the future. So we'll get it out of the way right now. We'll get our one kind of non-artifact deck out of the way so that I can just play 5,000 artifacts in every other draft. I mean, it looks like a great one. Looks like a very strong deck. We have lots of options of what to cut. All right, so here's a look at everything we've drafted right now. This deck is looking super, super sweet. It's got some great ramp going for it and some really, really big top end cards. So I think we want to cut a little bit of top end and we definitely don't want to cut a land. Probably cut a little bit of the cards that are just kind of dirtily cheap spells that are just kind of not the greatest little aggro cards like Servant to the Scale here. It's really the only thing at three mana or less that I think is like an immediate cut, which is awkward. Um, yeah, I do think I think five four mana cards and a six mana card is still going to be enough here. So we can cut two Hamlet Gluttons. Cut the Servant. We still have to cut five more after that. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven non-creatures. Could cut one Flame Discharge or one Epic Confrontation as kind of the most narrow removal. Sure, the Sparks and the Voltage Surges can only shoot cheap creatures, but basically everybody should have some amount of those. They're a lot more efficient. The Epic Confrontation, we have to have something big on board. I guess we've got plenty of big stuff. So I think I like Epic Confrontation over another Flame Discharge. These can just be pretty expensive to cast. So I'll cut that, and I do like the one guy as gift here. It can be a big finisher, as well as a way to counter a removal spell or something. It's actually really good with the Sunder Shaman. Give it Trample out of nowhere, so we blow up one of their artifacts, too. That's super sweet. All right, we got to cut four more cards. Um, Lannery is a better version of the Plundering Pirates, but the Plundering Pirates still look good. Our Gothian Opportunist also looks good. Did we just drop the Byway Courier? Just miss out on a little bit of card advantage here so that all of our three drops ramp us. Our Petunist gives us a Power Stone. Plundering Pirate gives us treasure. Captain Lannery gives us treasure. I guess, like, how good are we actually using that Power Stone, or how well are we using it? No, we're, we're using it pretty well. Because we can use that, if we're trying to skip over four drops, we can use that on Dragon Wing Glider, and we can use that on both of the Hamlet Gluttons because we can bargain it away. Um... But I guess it doesn't tap for the mana and then get bargained away for Hammer Gluttons, but it's still useful, I think. Yeah. Uh, f actually, at four mana, we've got a Briarbridge Control here, or Patrol here, which is not the greatest. I mean, if you've got a ton of clues, you get to dump something out for free, which is fun, but kind of like a worse version of the, uh, the elephant thing from Murders at Karlov Manor. So I don't think we're, we're playing around with that. I think that seems reasonable. We cut all the clue stuff. And then one last cut to go. I'm certainly not going to cut the scrap work cohort. This is part of what I was talking about that makes it so good is that it's like up front, it's going to be decent. A 3-1 and a 1-1. The 1-1, of course, we can bargain away. Um, but we can actually unearth it here sometimes because we have Ornithopter Paradise as well as three cards that make a treasure token. So it's not impossible for it to come back later in the game when we top deck some treasure token thing. So Cohort certainly stays in. 
even though it kind of looks like a white spell here. I think I'll just cut one of the obsessive skinners here. They're basically just a 2 mana 2-2. Two, two. Rarely will we have Delirium, because we'll need a creature, an artifact, an instant, and a sorcery engrave, and we only have one sorcery in the entire deck. So it's basically a 2 mana 2-2 two, two that maybe makes Flame Discharge cheaper if we draw those exact two cards, but we have other stuff that could be modified as well to make the Flame Discharge cheaper. This might, might actually be weak enough to drop both of them, put something else back into the deck. But I don't hate having like an additional two mana blocker to trade off, but you know, sure, I'm going to go a little higher on the curve. I'm going to drop both of the Skinners. I'm going to put one of these Byway Couriers back in, but uh, we'll check our mana base from here, see that we're close to even on each color, and we are exactly even at 10-10, so very simple mana base to build. We will call it a deck here. All right, here's a look at our final deck list for today, and it's probably going to be the least artifact-centered deck I will ever draft in this format. We are just playing a bunch of big green-red monsters. We've got huge top end with some Hamlet Gluttons, a Ridge Scale Tusker that can buff the whole board, the big old Sunder Shaman that hits the board. It's really big for its mana cost, and it tries to rip away some of your opponent's artifacts when it hits them in the face. We've got a cleanup crew here, just a big 6-mana six 6-6 six, six that also blows up an artifact when it hits the board. A lot of anti-artifact stuff going on here, which is not the side of the table that I would usually be on. I love me some artifact-focused decks, love blue-red artifacts in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, love blue-white artifacts in that format as well. Just love artifacts in general, but I also love going back to my Timmy roots every now and then and just smashing with giant creatures ramping into them with cards like Ornithopter Paradise and Treasure Tokens from Plundering Pirates and Lanneries and stuff, and uh, helping survive till we get to those big beefy plays with a bunch of cheap removal spells. Pretty simple, pretty beefy, monstrous deck here. Hopefully we get to play some giant creatures and smash some of our opponents with their little teeny artifacts, but we'll find out how it all plays out soon enough as we head into the gameplay. All right, here we are on the draw for game one. This is a very sketchy hand, but we can Voltage Surge their first play. We are on the draw to help get to the green source a little faster, and if we make it to three mana, we can at least play Adaptive off the Pirates. Almost definitely should Mulligan here, but there's something about Voltage Surge and Welding Sparks here that's, that's telling me to keep. We can absolutely have our face explode for doing this. Oh my god, why'd they put Esper Sentinel in here? All right, well... Whatever was telling me to keep was right, because there was a forest right on top of the deck. But the Esper Sentinel, super, super annoying. I'm just going to Voltage Surge that on turn two. Luckily, I don't have another turn two play anyway. Oh my god, our opponent is living the value dream. So Esper Sentinel taxes us whenever we play non-creatures. Um, or we let them draw cards if we don't pay the cost. Um, but I'm going to pay the cost, so I don't give them any cards, and I don't have to spend more mana on my spells. But they also have a bank buster now for a value engine. That's going to draw them three cards over time, removing those charge counters. Then it's going to give them a pilot that's big enough to crew it as a 4-4. And they can crew it without the pilot if they just have three power on the board in general. Whew. Our opponent's really living the value dream. Another two for one with Thraben Inspector. So they are going to draw quite a few more cards than us throughout this game, pretty much no matter what we do. Uh, I do like Captain Lannery Storm here. But they can just trade the Arcbound Prototype into her. They can also just block with the Bank Buster, so I need to wait till I have the mana open to Welding Sparks. If I can top deck a land, I can theoretically go Plundering Pirates... Uh, into the Lannery Storm. The one awkward part about this is Lannery won't evolve the Adaptive, but I can theoretically go Pirate into Lannery next turn if I hit an untapped land, and then I have a Lannery on board with three mana up, because uh, one from a land and two from treasures, so I can attack in holding up a Welding Sparks. Okay, but we did not hit that mana. Opportunist... Uh, helps give us something else to sack to the glutton, so I like that. It also evolves the adaptive. Yeah, I don't like how stable they are here, because that just gives them the time they need to get really ahead on cards off of that bank buster. But I don't think we have much of another option. Obviously, we don't have good attacks last turn. We don't have good attacks this turn, because they can crew the bank buster and block with a 4-4, and that's just bad for us. 
we don't want to have to lose a plundering pirate and a welding sparks to kill a bank buster or anything like that. All right, so here's the citizen's arrest, almost definitely on the adaptive. There it is. That is an exiled adaptive. Right, oof. Yeah, we need lands, not more five drops. Draws are awkward for us. I do have enough treasures on the board to blow up the bank buster if they go to crew it now. So it's awkward to just hold the mana up instead of playing Lannery and getting more treasures. But if I play the Lannery, I don't have the Welding Sparks mana. And that's a problem because the Power Stone can only give me mana for artifact spells or abilities. Cannot give me the mana for uh, an instant. All right, this is fine. Are they going to try to crew and put the uh, counters onto the bank buster? Well, this is going to go even better for me than if they just went for a block then. Now we'll just kill both. I guess not better for me, but it, it works about the same pretty much. All right, until the end of their next turn, they can play an Iron Apprentice, probably. Maybe they don't have their land for a turn, they take that instead. Nope, they take the Iron Apprentice. All right, well, we've dealt with all their current threats, but they have more card draw because they can unearth the research desk and do it again. And they have a clue token, so we're not out of the woods yet. We also still need mana to actually uh, get our own game plan going and, and threaten their life total. A single 3-2 doesn't do it insanely well. I mean, it attacks in fine here. It would trade into both the creatures. All right, next turn, they're going to play a Hex Gold Hover Wings. All right, fair enough. Cool, so since they attacked, they can no longer threaten to kill Captain Lannery, which means I can get my treasure tokens, which are incredibly important to me. So let's get them going. Time to make money, money, make money, 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 and they are down to 11. They're going to play a 3-2 flyer this turn. That's going to cost most of their mana. And we can definitely outrace that with a 6-6 six, six trample that also gains some life. And we've got the mana to do that this turn. Cannot profitably attack in with Lannery anymore. She's going to trade into a 1-2, which is not ideal. I mean, I guess if I am going to crack a treasure anyway, that'll make Lannery a 3-2, so it trades into this 2-2 or both of these cards, which is not bad. Yeah, she's never really going to attack in again anyway. I kind of feel like I might as well. What if I cohort here? So if I attack in, if I cohort pre-combat and crack a treasure, so she's a 3-2, it's going to be 1-2-3. Three, four. Then I'll have one, two, three, four mana up afterward. I don't get to play a glutton this turn if I play anything else, even if I do attack with Lannery. Okay, that's probably not worth it then. We we gotta just play a glutton. Which unfortunately means no power stone value, because I'm sacking it before I even play the cohort. I don't know, I guess as I said before, it's not like Lannery's likely to ever attack in again without instantly dying, so I'll still send her in here since we did make her 3 power, so their blocks aren't great. They're just solid. Yep. This is super okay, if they don't have a trick. Looks like they do not have a trick. Alright, we're gonna wipe the whole board. It's a 6-6 six, six trample versus nothing. They've got 3 cards in hand, so one removal spell clears out the glutton, but we've got another one coming. All right, they had to spend a whole board wipe on a single Hamlet Glutton, which we can absolutely recover from here. Voltage Surge. I would rather not have to sacrifice all of my treasures to get this Glutton down. 
Yeah, I mean, I can just play a Courier, hold up Voltage Surge. It's significantly less pressure on my opponent, but... They could very well just have another, like, one-for-one one removal spell. Ooh. If I kill this mouser right now, it doesn't get to modular to the other one, which is a pretty big deal. I think I will just do that. That way we're making sure one of their modular creatures is dying when they don't have another artifact on board. Maybe both of them, because they might just trade here. Alright, Tomb Raider's sick. Make sure we still get some damage, and yeah, they might just trade, in which case we're up a card, because the clue token we get out of Courier, and they don't get the value out of their modular ability. They could also just not trade, because they've got a little bit of lifelink for a tiny bit of breathing room, but we're definitely doing more damage than they're gaining. So they've got to consider it, but they are not going to trade, okay? So now we can scrap work cohort. Can't glutton here, because I'd have to sack both the treasures. Uh, to hit five mana, in which case I'd have nothing to bargain for the glutton. Disenchant? Alright, disenchant's pretty bad against our deck, so we're pretty happy with that. The few artifacts that we do have are going to be mostly tokens, like treasures and clues, or like just decent value plays like cohort, that haven't entered the battlefield effect anyway. So we're like the one deck that main deck naturalized doesn't work super great against in this format, so that's rough for our opponent. I am very tempted to haste out this cohort, and I think I'm going to do it. This does mean I'm going to need to top deck a land to play Glutton, but I'm going to go for immediate damage. I do have the bargain fodder still, since we have two different 1-1 uh, one -one artifact creatures to sacrifice. And we'll probably have a clue token as well. At this point, they just got to trade with Courier to not die. What's happening? Oh. I guess neither of us knew exactly what was going to happen there. They, I think they were making their land a copy of um, another artifact they control with mana value X. Yes, yeah, so they made their land a copy of the Arcbound Mouser. I don't know exactly why they wanted to do that. Like, obviously they thought that it was going to turn into a creature there and actually be a 1-1 lifelinker, but it's technically a 0-0 with a plus-one, plus-one counter on it, which is why that it why it died immediately. But since they already declared the block, even if it did work and made it a 1-1 lifelinker, they couldn't block another creature here. So, I guess maybe they just wanted to have an artifact to move the modular counters to? I don't know. I don't know. Either way, a uh, really solid showing from just green-red monsters just... Huge beat down in the end game, and we are going to start things off 1-0. Here we are on the play for game two. Little slow hand here, not starting till turn three, but we don't have a lot of one or two mana plays in this deck. So I don't think we're trying to mulligan to getting any faster. Honestly, mulliganing most likely just puts us down a card and gives us basically the same hand. Alright, Pirate into Cohort is a perfectly fine way to start a game off. We don't really have any huge top-end threats in this hand, but that's fine, because we've got plenty of attacking to do with these two cards alone. Playing against Blue-Black, which is likely a very controlling deck with a lot of card advantage. As we can see from their investigating going on. Yep, there's the Chrome Prowler to slow us down. Tap the pirate, stop a little bit of damage for the turn. You got it. Here's the cohort to go alongside it. And we are potentially flooding a little bit here because we already have seven mana and our curve does stop at six. We've got six lands and a treasure. There's a stern lesson for even more card draw and a power stone, which is pretty relevant in the set giving them mana for any of their artifact spells. So they're drawing cards and ramping up. What did they discard here? Just an island. Got some one mana removal. Yeah, Annihilating Glare. Okay, so they're just using the, uh, the Power Stone to sacrifice to cast their removal for cheap. 
We're pretty fine with that. All right, Chrome Prowler, we're also fine with. It is not a very good blocker here because it just trades with Cohort, which can unearth later anyway. But now I top decked Ridge Scale Tusker, so it's a slightly better blocker because killing a 4 2 is still uh, definitely good. But the Cohort still has unearth value for us. We're still just going to jam in for full damage and clear the board little bits to clear a path for the Tusker to send in. Now, any other threats they play, we're just going to burn away. Keep the Tusker coming in. Ashnod's Harvester, we definitely need to unearth our cohort before that can attack. Ooh, that's a really good turn for our opponent. A 3-1 and a 1-1 and the Chrome Prowler's back in their hand. Alright, so we need to unearth the cohort right now so that they can't just, like, unearth the Harvester and exile the cohort later. That'd be pretty bad for us. Plus, really no reason not to, because we're just going to um, cast one of our removal spells right now anyway. If anything, I mean, am I even going to cast Welding Sparks here, or am I okay with trading a 2-2 into the 3-1? I really think I'm okay with trading a 2-2 into the 3-1 here, and then casting Removal during their end step. Although it is a Chrome Prowler coming up, um, which means they're probably casting their next creature during our turn, in which case we're not using Removal. Yeah, it was probably worth the tempo to spark the 3-1 there. Because now we're not going to hit them at all this turn. They're just going to Chrome Prowler down the Tusker. Alright, Hamlet Button's pretty fine. Just cast that bad boy for seven. And then... Hopefully they can only kill, like, one of these with some kind of removal. So we still have the biggest creature on board, even if they blow up Hamlet Glutton with another uh, five-mana removal spell like the Annihilating Glare or something. If they don't have removal, we're in a tremendously good position here. I do think we really should have Welding Sparks earlier. They would be at like eight right now, maybe even six. All works out fine, though, because their best play is to play a massive blocker that I can just shoot for six. Two artifacts on board, so Sparks is five. X to a creature where X is three plus the number of artifact control. One, two, so five damage. If I play Scrapwork Mud here, it will be six damage, but I have to discard. Oh, I don't have to discard. Yeah, then we just play Mutt and Welding Sparks. Never mind. That I had to discard for the scrap work mutt. I do not. Well, that is fantastic. They don't have enough power to kill either of these. They can just trump five damage, take six, as probably the line. They could chump two damage, but trample is a huge deal on the Hamlet Glutton. Green might not get flying, but it can just run right over your creatures, just roll on through. Yeah, there's the concession from our opponent, despite being a nice blue-black kind of controlling deck there with tons of card draw. They couldn't find enough removal, so our big, beefy threats close out the game, and we are 2-0, and oh, heading into game three. All right, here we are on the play for game number three. Ooh, first time seeing our Dragon Wing Glider here, and we could even ramp into it like no one's business. Ornithopter Paradise and Pluttering Pirate. So basically, no matter what... We get to Dragonwing Glider on turn four. I don't think I'm spending Voltage Surge on this 1-1. It wouldn't be horrific because this does move its plus and plus on counter elsewhere when it dies, so we could kill it before they have another creature and be okay with me. Um, again, even if they spend a trick or something to kill this Ornithopter of Paradise, Plundering Pirate means turn four Dragonwing, so I'll, uh, I'll take that block there. Okay. Now I can Plundering Pirates hold up a Voltage Surge. Although the Voltage Surge is considerably worse right now because now these Iron Apprentices have targets to move their counters and having one move the counter to another one is actually really good uh, for our opponent. All right, cool. Let's just Dragon Wing Glider it up, right? We just Dragon Wing Glider into Ridge Scale Tusker. That's the order when you want to 
that you want to do things, have more creatures out when you Tusker, and also just get immediate damage out of that Flying Haste. Unless they have a Counterspell, they are playing blue, but they did not have the Counterspell. They might have the removal for the 2-2, but we can still re-equip the glider around. Nope, just card draw with Deadly Dispute. And take the 4, they are down to 16. Tezzeret's Touch. Turn that into a 5-5 that goes back to their hand when it dies? No thanks. What if it dies and your Tezzeret's Touch dies? Instead. And you get no counters anywhere? If they've got a combat trick here, that is absolutely necessary for them right now. They don't. They just have Deadly Dispute, so we completely counteract their only threats. And things are going swimmingly for us. Here's the Tusker. They need a board wipe to stand any chance. They're down to seven, facing tons of power on my board. There's Ingenious Smith, which digs for another artifact in the top four. Finds another Iron Apprentice there, just the Iron Apprentice deck over there. There's a Gixian Infiltrator. That's no blockers in the sky, though, so we still have five damage in the sky. And actually, we have seven in the sky. Unless they're one mana off of the treasure token. Can bounce this or something, but it cannot. That is game. We are 3-0 and now. At least a 50-50 run out of the event, no matter what. But we'll see how far we can take it from here. All right, here we are on the play for game four. We are very low on creatures. That is the one issue with this hand, but we've got plenty of draw steps to find stuff. We're on the play, so we don't need to be super aggressive. We can start on turn three and be fine. It's a dowsing device from our opponent. That could be a lot of extra damage real quick. Every artifact creature they play basically just has plus and plus O and haste. So that is really threatening in a format like this. They're also the uh, the blue-red deck, which seems like one of the most threatening because it's got all of the big artifact build-arounds from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. The cards like Captain Storm that put a plus one, plus one counter on the board every time they play an artifact. So they can get a lot of damage real quick, but they still have no creatures yet, which is really helpful for us. And as soon as they have one, now we just have all this mana up to throw some removal at it. Cogwork Wrestler. Okay, so they're just going to try to trick... With the Wrestler, make the Wrestler a two-power creature, make the Courier too small to kill. I can just Voltage Surge the Wrestler, or I can Gaia's Gift, um, so I get all this damage in still. Um, if I let the Courier die, I will have the Bargain Fodder for Glutton, but that seems a little too risky. I think we just Voltage Surge the Wrestler, right? Well, I don't know. If I gift, I get to hold up first Voltage Surge for their next play, potentially. Let's just gift and get all the damage in. Seems fine. I don't love that. The Cogwork Wrestler there is real good. Oh my god. Four mana, five, six, Gear Seeker Serpent. Yeah, this card's probably pretty nuts. It's got affinity for artifacts. Okay, our removal's pretty bad against beef like a five six i can still flame discharge it for four which since i can't cast hamlet glutton anyway is going to be the play since we modified our byway courier uh four will get the two additional damage and it'll be six so there you go all right I don't know if Gaia's Gift was objectively the correct play last turn, but if we hadn't have done that, if we hadn't have modified the Byway Courier, we would not have a way to deal with that Gear Seeker Serpent, so played out pretty well for us. There's the Oaken Siren. Haste it up with that Dowsing Device. That's a way better target for the Voltage Surge. 
Ooh, and a Vol uh, Volshock Splitter, also a better target for the Surge. And now they can just give plus X plus O every turn. A Dowsing Device. Seems like it's going to be nuts in the set. Was that still an artifact land, though? No, it's just a land. It's not an artifact anymore. All right, well, we have cleanup crew mana now, which is pretty sick. Do I want to blow up the splitter? I kind of want to just kill an Oaken Siren, but that means no attacks here. They're at 12, we're at 16. Trading Courier into the 2-2 two, two doesn't feel great, but then if I clean up crew the Oaken Siren, they're down to one creature left on board. It's probably fine. It gives us the token to play Hamlet Glutton next turn, even if we don't hit a land. And that means it's play a 6-6, six, six, followed by play a 6-6 six, six, Trample Gain 3. And I can play this and still hold up Vulture Surge. This seems fine. Blue Red probably doesn't have excellent ways to kill 6-6s, six just like we had a potentially hard time killing their 5-6. Ooh, Dragon Wing Glider. All right, get a taste of our own medicine on this one. It's a lot of damage, but the life gain from Hamlet Glutton is going to be huge. Uh, voltage Surge. We can Voltage Surge, sacking the clue to kill this 4-4. Four, four. But... Then I don't play Hamlet Glut in this turn. I mean, how much damage are they representing? They have four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we're going to be at well over nine. I think I just hard cast this to keep the clue so that I can still Vulture Surge for four on a future turn. Granted, I don't die right now, but they have to do 15 damage, and they're only at 6, so they have to hold up some blocks. I mean, if they can't do 15. If they can do 14 damage or less, they have to hold up blocks, but I guess if they can do 15, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we don't get another turn. Alright, sick. It's probably worth losing the clue token to kill this blocker and attempt lethal here. Let's see. They've got one card in hand. It's got to be worth it, right? Yeah, it's got to force the last card to basically be a bounce spell. There shouldn't be a lot of burn that's going to do the six damage here. All right. That was a scary game. Blue Red is a, a terrifying deck, and uh, we didn't even see any of the like insane build arounds like Captain Storm, but that Dowsing device was, was already looking pretty threatening. The amount of extra damage it would be potentially providing... Um, and the Gear Seeker super was super cheap, too. I don't even think I said Serpent right. The Gear Seeker super or something. Yeah, it looks sweet. I'm, I'm super pumped about this format in general. I am going to draft the heck out of this Tell Outlaws at Thunder Junction. We are now 4-0, and oh, guaranteed to be breaking even on gems, pretty much. The event is the same cost as a Premier Draft, so it is 1,500 gems to enter. Now we're getting 1,400 gems back and three packs, so pretty much a solid, solid place to be in terms of the value you're getting out of the event. But any more wins, and we are fully in the money, so let's see if we can get at least one more victory as we head into round five. Here we are on the play for round five. Huge risk here. But I'm about it today. We're going to discard a forest and draw a mountain, and it'll be perfect. Everything will be fine. See? We didn't even need to scrap work mutt. Um, I think I still ditch a land. Everything's only three mana right now, and we'll have a, a treasure token. We do have some expensive cards here, but I feel like it's probably worth uh, still just mudding. Oh, Steel Overseer, that's a sick build around. Oh, they're on the full Ornithopter Steel Overseer deck. Let's go. Our opponent has style. I want to do that so bad. Um, well, I have to just kill this Steel Overseer before it taps a single time, so take the turn off to, to Welding Sparks here. I'm not going to send in with scrap work, but we trade into a 1 1 and just make Ornithopter a 1 3 flyer, which is just not the greatest. It's got an ability in our graveyard, but we're not going to unearth it for a while because we're definitely playing Sunder Shaman next turn, then probably like flame discharging something. 
All right, opponent is still on two mana. Here's the Sunder Shaman. And if they can't deal with that, this is an issue for our opponent. I probably should have attacked with Mutt that turn. This trade's much less bad for me than trading into an Iron Apprentice. And obviously the Ornithopter was just a chump. Ooh, I really should have, because Mono Skellion's just going to kill Scrapwork Mutt without them even losing a card. So... They have to lose something to the Sunder Shaman no matter what. If it hits them, I blow up an artifact. If it doesn't hit them, it's because they chumped. Um, and then I can just flame discharge the Skellion before it does anything crazy. It's probably the game plan here. My apologies about the Windows boop. That was me and not you. Don't worry about it. Well, if they try to put this counter on the Mono Skellion, this is going to go great for us. Yeah, we already wanted to kill the Mono Skellion, so now we get to kill it and stop their counter from doing anything. I guess this means not playing the pirate this turn. I probably should have pre-combated the pirate. Said I could do this um, for three mana total. And I could crack the treasure to play the discharge. Still looks like a decent turn, but yeah, pre-combat pirate. That would have been a great turn. We might uh, bargain away the scrap work mutt. But I guess now I have the, the time to maybe bargain away a treasure for the Hamlet Glutton. More modular. All right, that's more stuff that gets around the Sunder Shaman a little bit. They can just chump and keep all the power toughness on the board. Ooh. All right, we are not bargaining away. I'm just going to Tusker it up. Make the board even better. All right, we're going to take the uh, Scrapwork Mutt for a 2-2 trade just an eternity later. Kill the Tracker, they get the counters on Ornithopter. And then I just kill or uh, Ornithopter later. Yeah. Get that modular out of the way. There's their own Scrapwork Mutt. I like the play. Oh, they've got Dragonwing Glider, too? How many rares are in this set? I've seen a lot of the same cards already. We have Dragonwing Glider. We've played against two opponents with it uh, already, which has been pretty fast. All right, Scrapwork Mutt Voltage Surge is pretty excellent value. I could Plundering Pirate Voltage Surge instead, but... I like uh, clearing this out without spending anything that's really going to do anything else for us. The treasure is still going to be good bargain for Hamlet Glutton, but I can't really bargain away um, the Scrapwork Mutt for the Hamlet Glutton because Unearth means it's just back for one turn. And if I'm spending two mana to Unearth it anyway, I might as well just spend that two mana to Hard Cast Glutton instead of bargaining. So, all right. They're down to one card in hand, but they have dealt with the biggest threat on our board, our 6-6 six -six that keeps blowing up their artifacts. So if they've got powerful enough spells, they could stabilize from here. We'll see. And the Scrapwork Mutt helps dig for the strong stuff. Discards an epic confrontation because they have no creatures to fight with anyway. All right, Tomb Raider, sure. I can't play the Glutton this turn anyway, so we might as well get the haste damage in and put them to two. I love how this is like the least artifact heavy deck I think I'm ever going to draft in this format, and Goblin Tomb Raider is just still always a 2-2 two -two haste for one. That card is just nuts in this format. We are officially in the money now. We are 5-0, still undefeated, and leaving with more gems than it costs to enter the event. Super, super great draft so far, but we'll see how far we take it as we head into round 6. Oh no! We have our first hand, or the Tomb Raider is not going to be a 2-2 two -two haste, but it is going to make the Evolving Adaptive a 1-mana 2-2. Two -two. Um, this hand's a little risky. It can flood out. Having four lands in the opener is not ideal, but 
In this deck, I mean, you've seen it in several other games, we've got powerful five and six mana cards. So it might not be the absolute end of the world. Plus, we got the scrap work mud. If we can draw into that, we can ditch some extra lands. There's Ornithopter. Not really ramping, though. We're just getting aggressive. Airless Mirror is actually annoying. It still just trades into one card. So we just play the Pluttering Pirate and uh, let, it, let it trade into one creature here. So, uh, I send in Tomb Raider, it has to trade into my 3-2 or 2-2. If I send an Adaptive, it can trade up into the Adaptive. I think we just let them trade into the Adaptive. We don't know if we're going to draw into bigger creatures anytime soon. So the Pirate is hitting for just as much damage. Just hitting for three every turn. Mint Strosities. Actually very good here. Just super good defensively. Just a high power blocker so it trades into anything and you get a food out of it every time. Let's uh, Plundering Pirate and Discharge for one and get that blocker out of the way. We want to keep all this damage on our board. To keep the clock ticking. They're down to 11, but they have a food token on board. There's Cutthroat Centurion, just a 2-2, but it still trades into a 3-2, so not bad at all here. Actually, they could sack the food to just eat one of our creatures, but then the food's gone, so we still have to just send it and get this damage in. That is actually very good here. Centurion's probably another card that's much better in this format than it was in its format initially. Servo Schematic? Servo Schematic is busted with Centurion. Because now they have a really good way to sack the schematic to get the next 1-1 out of it. Okay. We are definitely looking for one of our big tramplers, or like our flyer at this point, because that is a stable board from our opponent. They've even got the one-mana removal that sacks the thing, gets another blocker. There's the Mirror Sire, which gives another blocker. This is a huge swing back in their favor here with the Centurion, with all these cards that are beefing it. Yeah, we have to draw some threats here. This game is over, uh, out of our favor here. And it's looking bad. Our first draw is not a threat at all, just another land. Oh, they got the crown too that lets them draw a card every time they're sacrificing stuff. Or just deal two extra damage to us. I mean, that works too. Move it to the Mirror Sire so they can sack that draw card. There's a Voltage Surge. That's a huge draw. I can kill the Centurion now and kind of just stop taking damage. This doesn't have an instant speed equip, does it? No. Uh, any equipment that says, like, attach for a certain mana cost, the attach abilities, you can do at instant speed. They haven't printed those in a long time, but this set has some really old cards in it, like Mirror Sire, so just wanted to double check. Okay, so we still can't really attack, but we can Voltage Surge the Centurion, sack in a treasure. I think I'm just gonna... Yeah, I'm just gonna do that before they draw into a card that could save it. And we do have to sack. We gotta make it four damage, because then they can just sacrifice something in response to save it. If we don't. Alright, they will sack the Mirror Sire for the value. But they could have done that. Even if I tried to Voltage Surge in response to them moving the crown. Because until the re-equip resolves, it's still technically on that first creature. Okay, Flying Lifelinker is actually... Just as bad as that Centurion was for us. It's less damage, technically, but the life gain is massive for our opponent. A 3-1 Flying Lifelink here. It's like Gaia's Gift. That can kill the Vault Scourge. 
So that's a little something. I could also try to just trample over for two points of damage here if they just block with a single 3-1. I don't think there's much point in that, though. We don't have enough direct burn that there's a huge difference between our opponent being at six versus three. There is a very big difference between them having a good lifelinker on board and not. So we're going to do that. Kill that thing. Does mean they draw another card, though. The Transmigrant's Crown absolutely taking this game. It's Teething Wormlet, which is more life gain every time they play an artifact. Trail of Crumbs, which digs through their deck every time they sacrifice foods, looking for more plays. Our opponent has hit so many value plays that are just excellent uh, when we get into a top deck war like this, but there is exactly what we've been waiting for. Something that can supply a lot of damage real quickly. So how much damage do I need to be worried about taking here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, any way to get plus and plus one counters uh, with the Teething Wormlet, it'll get one. So that's still not lethal. So we can send in maximum damage here. And we kind of need to when they have Wormlet and a food. It's going to take three swings to kill them. No matter what, pretty much. Let's get that damage in. Still holding on to the mountain because we do have a scrapwork mutt in our deck. Alright, so they are going to go for the Trail of Crumbs, look for a permanent in the top two. They find Barbed Spike, so they find a flyer. That's perfect for our opponent. It is just a Chumper, but a Chumper is enough here, the amount of damage they have on board. Oh my god. And they top decked that turn too. They didn't just get the Trail of Crumbs draw. They hit Witch's Vanity to kill our token as well. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot we could do there. They had some excellent value plays to win a top deck war situation. Yeah. Cannot break through for lethal. We can go block, 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 take two. We're technically not dead yet but there's like just about no shot here right yeah they're getting another food token which draws another card off trail crumbs and gains them another three life I don't think it really matters what we do here. I think we die no matter what, but our only hope is some random just mega lethal lannery attack, which means we need a bunch of treasures to buff up. We just drag and wing glider it up and sack a bunch of treasures next turn. If they take the trade, at least it's slightly harder to die this turn. But yeah, I think that's really all we got here. I can't really attack much harder than that at five. Get another Trail of Crumbs draw. Finds a hidden stockpile, which gives them a 1-1 every end step. Have to block like this. I'm going to have to block two creatures. This feels like the best block. Maybe it's better to keep the flyer than the 2-2, two -two, but I don't think it matters. They're at 14 now. Now getting another chump blocker every turn. And yet again, they top decked a spell and hit a spell off Trail of Crumbs. And there's one final land for the salt in the wound for us. Unfortunate end of that game. It probably did about as much damage as we could in the early game. Didn't quite find the lethal. And then lost the top deck war hard. Our opponent on a much more grindy, mid-rangey deck that has a lot of those huge draw spells in the late game. Especially like the Transmigrant's Crown rare. Just drawing them a ton of gas as they were sacking around. So 5-1, and one, our first loss of the events as we head into Game 7. Here we are for Game 7. I'm not going to start at all till turn 3, but super keepable on the play. On the draw, it might be a tiny bit slow. But I think I would still keep it because our 3-4-5 is so good. 
having four creatures on the board when we play Tusker. But I guess technically three other creatures. So three that are getting the counter. There's a Hamlet Glutton to top things off after the Tusker. I guess I could Glutton first to have a counter on the Glutton. But I think we just want to roll out here. Our opponent's on an excellent start. They've got the Ornithopter Paradise to ramp up, and they've used all of their mana each turn. Yeah, one mana turn one, two mana turn two, three mana turn three. Really, really good curve from our opponent that kind of flips the tempo, uh, potentially in their favor a little bit, even though they're on the draw. Um, Courier's going to trade for Courier, even with a plus one, plus one counter on it, so we're just going to send it in, see if we get this damage in. If not, it's a trade that's kind of inevitable. Regardless. Alright, so here's the cohort. Now we do have a clue token for Glutton instead of a soldier if we want to keep all of our power and toughness on the board. I think our opponent being in green-blue here is going to be a much better deck at the late game again. Just a ton of clue tokens and card draw. Just card advantage stuff in general. Yeah, map tokens work as well to set up the draws. And there's that, like, one mana Gear Seeker Serpent. I guess two mana, it, it always costs double blue. But yeah, two mana, five, six, that can give itself unblockability. All right, well. Oh, no, we didn't hit a second green source, so we can't actually Tusker yet. Hmm. I didn't quite think of that issue. What if the, what if the lands we draw to get to five mana are not green? Then... We have to crack a clue and play, like, one burn spell that's not big enough to kill Serpent. It's also not a green source, and it's a terrible time to be crewing a 5-5 five, five and attacking into a 5-6, so it's just a very bad draw in general. Well, could get got by the mana base here, having just uh, double green spells. I still think the keep was was a snap keep on the play or on the draw. It is just an issue that we drew more red sources. It happens. This flame discharge is just X mana right now because we don't have a modified creature. So it is not going to be good enough to Serpent and Cohort, or I'm sorry, to Discharge and Cohort the Serpent. I could Voltage Surge and Cohort block the Serpent, but then I lose my entire board. <laughs> no. Well, if there's anything we learned to today, even in the games that we won, um, Gear Seeker Serpent is probably the best common in the format, honestly. So hopefully in the future it's going to be harder to run into turns where your opponent double gear seeker serpents you or games where they double gear seeker serpent you because that feels insurmountable especially when we can't cast our biggest blockers that could try to stop those things yeah we're getting smashed but at least we're learning while we're losing and what we're learning is that this is a uh, you probably pack one, pick one that over most uncommons and rares in the set. Gear Seeker Serpent seems wild. Oh, I could have just crewed Express and blocked with it and not lost a creature there. I was so concerned about getting the plus one plus one counters off attacks that I forgot about its ability to block as well. Again, it really doesn't matter at this point. They've even got a 5 6 flyer. The endless stack of 5-6 has arrived, and there's no second green source still, so that is just game. We would have had to draw considerably better there. Not considerably, we just needed uh, one more green source to have a back and forth, at least, a game. But, yeah. Mana base worked out poorly for us, and our opponent had a very explosive hand, so not much we can do about that one. We are 5-2. and two. Heading into round eight, really hoping we get at least one more victory here. That would let us go to nine games total, the maximum you can play in these events. So hopefully we win this next round, so at least we get to play with our deck as many times as possible.
All right, here we are for game eight. What could be the final game of Magic if we lose this one? We are five and two right now. We're on that borderline of getting pushed out of the event, and this is just too risky of an opening hand. We don't get to really do anything till like turn five, and that's only if we find the bargain fodder for the gluttons. Just a little too much that can go wrong with this hand, so I am gonna have to take the mulligan here to something that actually has some early plays. And unfortunately, this hand is even worse. Two green sources, four red spells, and even if we hit the red cards, we're also not casting anything till turn four, turn five even. It's an express with nothing to crew it. Uh, I'd be really disappointed for things to end like this, but I think we have to mulligan to five on the play, immediately putting us way behind in card advantage. But this hand is the best hand we've drawn so far, even if it's going to be a five card version of the hand, it'll be better than our six or seven that we could have started with, so here we are. We're going to roll with Captain Lannery Storm into the cohort, I think. And I think we gotta gamble a little bit at this point, this low down on cards. Um, and just hope to top deck one land in the first couple turns to roll things out. I don't think I can really afford to go down on spells here, considering I only need three lands to play Lannery and Cohort if I draw any more after that. Without drawing like my five drops and stuff, that could be deadly, because then we're just down more cards with the Flood. Yeah, I'm gonna gamble a bit on it. I think we kind of have to draw pretty perfectly from here to uh, to have a chance of like a five card hand beating your average seven anyway. So let's go for it. And Ornithopter is perfect. That's the land right there. There's an arc bound prototype. That's annoying for us. Um, that's annoying enough to voltage surge it. Let's go full control just in case Arena doesn't want to give me the option to voltage surge pre-blocks. So here's the surge. All right. Well, as you can see, we are going to get punished by Mole getting down to five, where I'm going to have no more spells in hand very soon. But... We do have a pretty nice amount of damage hitting the board early, plenty of creatures, some mortar pod they can sack to kill a 3-1. That's actually really good against our cohort, that's kind of annoying. Um, do I want to just not play the cohort then, since they can just kill it for free anyway? Kinda. Kinda would rather play opportunist at that point. Well, they can also bone splitter up the mortar pod. Yeah, and even if they do sacrifice the germ to kill the cohort, they can just like play more creatures that they can then put the mortar pot on due to sack and kill the cohort. So it's not like the cohort's going to get any better later. It's just that the opportunist is more likely to actually damage them right now. There's always the chance that we play a cohort and they don't immediately kill it because they just want to bone splitter block Lannery. And we're in a rock and a hard place here. Things aren't going to be good for the cohort whenever we cast it. I'm just going to start with the opportunist. And they are going to bone split it up. So that must mean no more creatures, no more creatures. Um, this is an issue, isn't it? Uh, two mana put a plus and plus one counter on artifact or creature control. And whenever plus and plus one counters are put on it, put twice as many instead. Or no, that many plus one. So two mana for two plus one plus one counters on one of their permanents. So that can make a really big blocker. But, oh my god, Hamlet Glutton is actually castable here. That is wild. Um, Let's cast it pre-combat for the extra Lannery damage if they don't just trade for Lannery. Uh, but what I was going to say is we've got enough damage on the board that the... Germ almost definitely has to just like trade into Lannery right now. Which means no Ozolith counters, no getting it to be big enough to actually block super profitably later. So Ozolith probably not that bad for us unless they have a really cheap creature to throw the counters on. Autonomous Assembler, well that's a very good creature. 
Sub Obsessive Skinner's also solid, but the Assembler's definitely better. Oh yeah, Skinner with Ozlith is actually kind of crazy. Get two counters off of it. All right, well, Glutton still sends in. The Opportunist does not anymore, though, which is not ideal. Because now we put them to six, but then they have a blocker big enough to just trade into the Glutton. Because they just Ozolith it up to 6-6 six, six stats. Ooh, and Wanderer Strike proliferate onto Assembler. We've got a wide enough board state. We're still threatening some bad stuff. Hold up, do they have any mana up? They don't have any mana up. One, two, three, four, five artifacts? Even the green-red deck has enough artifacts for Welding Sparks to be eight damage? Let's go. There's the concession. Well, I said it when we started that game with the Molta Five. We kind of had to take the gamble so we had as much action, as many spells as possible when we're starting the game down two cards. So we were like, well, best bet here is to just line up the best curve out of these five cards as we can and hope to top deck perfectly. And my lord, did we top deck perfectly. Finding that Hamlet Glutton for the huge threat, finding the Welding Sparks to get rid of their huge threats. And I'm really happy with the waiting on the cohort. It worked out pretty dang well. Um, but I think the cohort actually would have been fine at any point because they just didn't have enough creatures to super utilize that mortar pod super well. But obviously, meant we still had a wide board state, plenty of threats post uh, Hamlet Glutton here. So super, super excellent game for us. Just some really solid, really lucky draws for the most part after some unlucky mulligans to start things off. And that has done it. We are officially getting to play in nine games in this event, the maximum number of games you can. We are six and two right now, heading into a ninth battle, the final boss, win or lose, deciding if we can get the maximum prize out here or just so close to a perfect run. We'll see how it all pans out for us as we head into the final battle of the Artifacts Remix Draft. All right, here we are on the play for the final battle. We've got a Voltage Surge against their first threat and a great way to get things started on turn three. So a slower start for sure, but most of our uh, our deck in general is like three mana and more. And there's a Lannery. That certainly speeds up the start, giving us treasure tokens to try to dump out two spells in one turn later. And we will absolutely bolt the bird immediately especially since they've only played one color of lands here. They might need the fixing on that, but even if they don't, just slowing them down um, is valuable, stopping the ramp. All right, so Lannery's going to start slamming in. There's a Shadow Spear. That's a very threatening card. Trample and Lifelink onto anything they put it on makes it really hard to race your opponent. Let's go Adaptive plus level it up here. So pre-combat's uh, opportunist giving me the power stone towards the towards the cohort next turn. Cool. Really, really aggressive rollout here. Even if the adaptive didn't technically hit turn one, it's still going to be very big for its mana cost. There's the green source. Our opponent was relying on that Ornithopter of Paradise a bit. And there's a 2-2 lifelinking evolving adaptive to try to buy some time. Let's get our adaptive up to 3-3 three, three stats, and I think we're sending in the whole team still, though. Please use the Power Stone. Thank you, Arena. Crack a treasure pre-combat for extra damage off of Lannery. Although Lannery is probably the trade they're taking here. We still want to get more damage in and clear a path because we don't really need Lannery's treasures anymore. We've got plenty of mana. Let's just get a really wide board state and make it super hard for them to recover without a full-on board wipe. Another evolving adapter. That's super sweet. We've only got the one, but the double up is... Awesome for a deck. All right, well, we don't have any options here. We just send in the whole team. All the plays are up to our opponent at this point. 
keep the land though in case we draw into a scrap work mutt. Our fate is in our opponent's hand, and their and their hand is not good enough, it looks like, to change the outcome of this game. Just a really, really aggressive curve. Really the one play that I think mattered more than anything else that game was just bolting that Ornithopter immediately to slow down our opponent's uh, defenses and, and make it take just too long for them to set up blocks against all of the aggressive creatures that we got to flood the board with. It did help a lot that they were relying on that to try to hit their green source and they missed a land drop there uh, without the the bird so excellent uh excellent stuff from the deck we get a full seven win run we get max prize out out of our first remix draft of the artifacts format super super awesome stuff we'll take one last look at the deck here before we cash out those prizes, but it was a pretty fun one. I don't think I'm ever gonna draft this archetype again unless I get like forced into it because I love artifact stuff, and this is just like big green beats, really. It's less of the artifact synergies and combos and stuff, but it was a really good way to get an entrance into the format. If you want to just dabble a toe in there and just draft a really standard, really simple deck and just draft green red monsters, it's cool to see that that is super viable in the set, at least enough to grab a 7 and 2 run. So. Really, really nice stuff from the deck, but I'm very excited for our future drafts here where we can play around with a lot of the more, um, a lot of the more kind of crazy and unique archetypes in the format, like that sacrifice kind of stuff going on with the black deck from our opponent. That was looking real spicy, real scary. And of course, some of the most busted things you can do in the format, like two mana gear seeker serpents, we were seeing from a lot of our blue opponents. So, yeah, really, really good stuff from the deck. Nice to start things off simple and then get crazier and crazier as we progress with the drafts in the format. And of course, always nice to start a brand new set with a 7-win run. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more new recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below where I'm live every Wednesday. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.